This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is the television show Barney Miller, a sitcom from the 1970s. I argue that it's a great uh, television program, and I have three people who will back me up, I think. <laughs> the sitcom Barney Miller from ABC Television in the 1970s is the subject of this discussion. I have three people who will talk about it, uh, but before we do, I'd like to give each of my guests a little bit of introduction by way of themselves. So let me start up on the top with uh, Mike White. Mike, if you could uh, give a little bit of background about who you are, what you do, and your interest in Barney Miller. Sure, yeah. I'm Mike White. I'm the, my primary uh, not day gig is being the host of the Projection Booth podcast, but I also host a podcast called The Life and Times of Captain Barney Miller, which I think will be a little bit more um, apropos of this conversation. You can find that at barneymillerpodcast.com, and we are going through every month and looking at i think three episodes of the series i'm only up to about the fourth season though so anything past that you guys are going to lose me because i've seen the whole thing but in the original run i think so uh don't, don't tell me about nick dying i don't want to hear anything about it <laughs> uh so mike uh did you watch the show in its original run then were you a fan a long time fan or did you discover it later on Oh no, I, I'm I'm old. I so I've seen it uh, back when it was originally playing. I, I specifically remember seeing it. I think in its original air plus, and of course in reruns during the summer. I think I even watched a little bit of Fish, but I don't recall if I saw that much. Uh, Lance Strait, let me ask the same of you. If you could get a little bit of background about who you are and uh, your opening volleys about Barney Miller. Sure thing. I'm a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. And I study a number and write about a number of different things, uh, including media and technology, communication and philosophy, uh, media ecology and general semantics, uh, <coughs> including a book uh, called Media Ecology and Approach to Understanding the Human Condition. Uh, a lot of my work is based on folks like Marshall McLuhan and Neil Postman, who are very interested in television, and, and some of the work I do is also based on analysis of popular culture, including things like science fiction, but also television and television history. Uh, so that's where I come to Barney Miller. Uh, I, too, am old, and so I watched uh, it in its original run back in those days. If you missed an episode, so you missed an episode. Um, so you didn't have the chance to watch all of it, but I do remember seeing some of it on reruns. And, and, and like my guy, I missed Fish, but I know that I saw episodes with him. Um, I don't know if it was a summer rerun or maybe it was later in syndication. Um, but uh, I, I did get to be interviewed about the program for the International Business Times, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and that was, I don't know, back about I don't know, five, six years ago. I have to ask you, Lance, uh, your background, the rest of us seem to be in dens or rooms. Is that one of those fake backgrounds? Or is, uh, it looks like, like, like Jason or, or, or Michael Myers <laughs> is going to come through and stab you. Yes, it's a it's a it's a virtual background, but it's a close up of an old style TV screen. Ah, or you know, for perhaps younger viewers may not realize this, but black and white was never black and white. It was it was black and blue, and when you look closely, you saw uh, 525 lines alternating back and forth to create that motion. And for many of us, even though color television was introduced in the 60s. We still watched a lot of television on little black and white sets, um, which is the way that I watched a good amount of Barney Miller. And my final guest is Otto Bruno in the bottom corner. Otto, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and your opening thoughts about Barney Miller. Well, uh, these days I'm a freelance writer and a radio host. I've hosted a radio show for about 22 years here on a local public uh, station but that's all music of the 30s and 40s you know the great american songbook and uh, i've been a freelance writer for about 25 years now 
And uh, I just, a couple weeks ago, <laughs> the book came out. It's called Barney Miller and the Files of the Old One, Two, And it is my first uh, full book. And I, you know, when Mike said, oh, I'm old. Well, I knew that out of the three of us, I don't know how old you are, Dan, but I knew out of the three of us, he had to be the youngest because I saw Lance's resume. And he has done so much that I just assumed he was older <laughs> uh, than Mike was. And I know I'm older than Mike was, than Mike is. So um, I did start watching Barney Miller when it first came on. In fact, uh, at the very beginning of the book, I talk about, I, I have an actual memory of sitting down and watching the very first episode with my dad. Um, my father was uh, someone who, uh, you know, you read all these stories and see all these movies where they talk about how sons could only connect to their father through sports. Well, my father could not possibly have cared less about sports. He was not interested in sports, uh, but we were able to connect through TV and the movies. We'd go to the movies together and we would sit down and watch television together. And um, this was one of those shows that uh, we watched together from the very beginning. So uh, I did watch it all the way through its initial run. I watched it whenever I could see it uh, in syndication and reruns. I, in fact, I was always a little annoyed that it didn't seem to play on reruns as much as some of the other shows did. I mean, you know, you couldn't turn around without, God forbid, seeing Gilligan's Island 18 times a day. But uh, it was hard to see Barney Miller on, um, you know, in syndication. But uh, as soon as the, you know, the, the first DVDs, they started releasing them one season at a time, and I started buying them, and then they stopped after season three, and that ticked me off. And then uh, finally Shout Factory put out the whole uh, eight seasons on DVD, and I, you know, I had that order in before it even came out. I was, I, I was waiting for that. So uh, I truly think it is one of the very best sitcoms of all time. I do. I really think it's one of the best sitcoms of the 70s, and there were some really good sitcoms in the 1970s. The ones that are always talked about and always remembered, uh, in particular, seem to be All in the Family and MASH, and while I would never deny the importance of both of those shows, I thought both of those shows eventually lost their way and, and veered off into dramedy. Mm -hmm. And while Barney Miller always, always um, tackled tough issues as well, they always put the focus first on being funny. And that's what I appreciate about it. Yeah, Barney Miller is one of my, I put in the top 10 sitcoms I did a an essay some years back. I'm 57, by the way, so I don't know if that makes me where that puts I got you by one year. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, uh, I did, uh, the reason I, sometimes you get things bubbling up. I'd mentioned before we went on the air, I'm going to be doing a, a show about Mickey Spillane and it just popped into my mind a few days ago for some reason. But one of the reasons I wanted to do this show is I was thinking about a woman I dated whose name was Denise Miller. And that was the name of an actress who was on the fish show although it's not the same woman. Oh, okay. Uh, but so, so I was thinking, oh, let me do it. Let me do, because I've was i I've been, done a few shows. I'm trying to do uh, great television shows, and I'm starting with sitcoms. And then also about two years ago, I interviewed the actor Paul Lieber, who played for a season on Barney Miller. And, and I, so, I interviewed Paul as well, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, I don't know which one of you guys want to start, but uh, let's talk about uh, the premise of the show, because, you know... Uh, up to that point, as far as I know, well, I guess there was my mo no, there was uh, the the Fred Gwynn television show. Oh, Car Fifty Four. Yeah. But this was yeah. really, in, in a sense, I mean, that was a decade before Barney Miller or so. Uh, but this was uh, an unusual premise for a sitcom. So, how did that actually get started? Whichever one of you guys wants to take that. Well, um, from what I could find out through my research. You know, you will see on the front of every Barney Miller show, it says created by Danny Arnold and Ted Flicker, Theodore J. Flicker. Uh, Flicker is probably best known today for a 1967 motion picture called The President's Analyst, which is actually a pretty good film. 
and um, was so controversial at the time because it poked fun at the FBI and the CIA and things like that, that supposedly J. Edgar Hoover had it pulled out of theaters. Um, but what happened was these two guys, and Hal Linden told me one story, Danny Arnold's sons told me another story. They're, they weren't quite sure whether it was their agents or whether it was the network, but apparently both Flicker and Arnold had an idea for a situation comedy about policemen. And um, whether it was the agents or the network who said, well, we're not going to buy both of them. If you guys both have similar ideas, why don't you get together and come up with a premise and do something with it? And we'll look at that. So that's how it happened that they did this original pilot. And that pilot was turned down by the network, by ABC. And ended up being shown on a, on a summer show called Just for Laughs, where um, uh, Hal Linden, I think, used the line that Just for Laughs had more dead pilots than the Japanese Air Force in World War II or something. You know, some kind of line that you couldn't say today, but I just did. Um, and uh, so what happened is it gets turned down. It gets dumped on this Friday night show. And then somehow Danny Arnold went and bought out the deficit financers of the show. So just the money people, because apparently the money people had 50%, Danny had 25% and Flickr had 25% or something like that, or 33 and 33 and 33. So Arnold went and literally, literally mortgaged his home and bought out the deficit financers so he could get control of the show. And then he went to ABC and convinced them to give the show another chance. And they said, okay, we'll give you two episodes. <laughs> you can do two more episodes with an option on 13, meaning a mid-season replacement. So if we like these, the next two episodes better, we'll give you a mid-season uh, uh, slot. And apparently, Danny Arnold called up Flicker and said, we don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. Don't come in. You're done. And obviously, that didn't sit well with Mr. Flicker. However, according to uh, the Writers Guild of America guidelines and rules, because the premise, because the next two shows were still basically the same premise, he had to get creator credit. So everybody I spoke with, Hal Linden, Max Gale, the Arnold uh, brothers, um, the writer, Tony Sheehan, right, writer, producer, and all these guys, they all said they never met and never saw Ted Flicker in their lives. So he never was on the set again after that first initial pilot, which, as Mike knows very well, was called The Life and Times of Barney Miller, and then it was just shortened to Barney Miller. Right. That, that, that brings... Cause... For many years, in the back of my mind, I said to myself, when I first saw Barney Miller, there was a show with Hal Linden with that same title, but more words. And I, so right. it was on basically this summer, the, the, oh, what would have been the summer of 74, I guess? It was shown in August of 74 on this program called Just for Laughs. Yeah. yeah. I've gone on, on a lot of TV uh, websites, you know, for shows people can't remember the name of or what. And I said, I could have sworn there was a show it was only one episode, I guess, with Hal right. Linden playing a Barney Miller character. And then when he came back, it was somehow different. So was, did, this, exactly. did, that, did that pilot feature Barbara Barry, his wife, more? No, so, it featured Mike. Who was the woman that did the... Uh, oh, uh, gosh. <clears throat> I don't remember who the wife was. She Are... played Joey Bishop's wife on, right. <laughs> on his sitcom. A beautiful actress, and I can't think of her name now. I feel bad, because she, she was a good comedian. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and of course, the whole premise of the life and times of Barney Miller was that it was supposed to show his life at the station house and his life at home and how they interacted and, you know, the, the tension it caused and all that. And what happened is when they showed that, uh, even the first pilot, Everybody, the reviewers, the, the network people, in a rare case of the network people actually getting something right, um, nobody liked the stuff at home because it was just the same old domestic comedy stuff. But the stuff at the station was gold. It was great. 
And so they very, very quickly veered off and went straight to all the stuff, you know, a workplace comedy, basically. And, and as you say, the woman who was eventually hired to play his wife, Barbara Barry, ends up fading from the scene because there was nothing for her to do. And she got kind of fed up and she didn't, you know, she didn't want to hang around for four or five shots uh, a season to come in and bring his lunch, you know? Right. So, so uh, uh, since we have the basic premise then, uh, let's, let me start with uh, you, Mike, and let's talk about uh, Hal Linden since he, he's basically the main character. But it's very rare when you think of a, a titular sitcom, either it's, if it's the real name of the actor or the, the character that the actor is playing, that the character, in a sense, isn't the star. Because Hal Linden, uh, you know, I mean, he might have had the most lines in any particular show, but he was the straight man. Oh, yeah. Which was fantastic. I love that he is that straight man and he's the one that keeps them all together. And he, there's a lot of episodes where he just disappears into his office for a long time. But when he comes out, he comes out with authority. And I mean, he gets to see the lunacy. I mean, the lunacy, not just of New York City at the time, but also the lunacy of the his own men and the people that he's brought in. It's such an interesting premise that we just we don't leave the station house very much at all it almost all takes place just on that one set it is so rare when we leave i mean to Otto's point from earlier seeing his house was something that you would see eh, kind of often in the first few episodes but then that guy dropped and you were just in that station house yeah. and yeah him his presence was you described it perfectly him being the straight man he was just there to be the one to react and he could give reaction shots like nobody's business yeah uh, and it's, it was basically a 23 24 minute playlet uh yeah you know uh, every week uh, let me ask you lance um uh given the multi-ethnic uh cast of the time yes there were the leah shows there was sanford and son chico and the man but this was i think the first show where the ethnic differences were not the main cause for there being ethnic characters uh, on. So what, uh, and this is directed to you first, Lance, uh, what was the impact of a show like this uh, just being thrust into the culture? Because you had an Asian in Jack Sue, you had a black fellow, you had a, uh, an, ethnic, uh, uh, an ethnic white guy in Wojohowitz, uh, then you had Gregory Sierra as the, the Hispanic, um, and I, I, was Fish supposed to be Jewish? I'm not yes. sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Barney Miller was Jewish. Fish so, and Barney were both yeah. Jewish. So, yeah. uh, uh, Lance, if you could speak on that uh, aspect of the show. Sure. But but first, let me just note that uh, when, when Otto brought up uh, All in the Family and MASH, there, there's a third sitcom that, that goes with them, which was the Mary Tyler Moore show, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, which can be overlooked because it doesn't have the same obvious uh, emphasis on social issues and social relevance, but the initial premise of that was that she was going to be divorced and then they, they kind of dropped that because it was a little earlier than the other two and they weren't willing to go out on that limb. Um, but it did introduce, or, or maybe not introduce, but certainly solidified the idea of the workplace comedy um, which Barney Miller then, uh, you know, picks up on. Uh, so I, you know, I think that's particularly important. I mean, also the issue of divorce, although uh, Barney Miller didn't go there, it was one day at a time uh, in 1975 that, that made that safe for television. Prior to that, even though most of America, the divorce rate rates were skyrocketing, all the single parent sitcoms, they were always widows and widowers and, um, because divorce still had the stigma, but Barney Miller did deal with, with him being separated at a certain part, point. They just didn't go all the way uh, on that. Um, but uh, in, in one sense, it's very New York. Um, you know, that New York is uh, very, uh, very ethnic. And, and multiracial. And I, I don't know where you guys are from, but I'm from New York and, and it definitely had that New York, New York feel. Um, and to the point about Barney and, and Abe uh, you know, being uh, 
of fish being being Jewish, um, that kind of played against type. Uh, you know, you know, typically, I mean, the, the long the old stereotype was of the Irish cop, um, and then uh, added to add to that the Italian cop. But there was there's a there was a tradition in, in TV sitcoms for a long time where either Jews or Italians represented ethnicity. Um, you know, that that was symbolized just the general concept of being ethnic as opposed to being just basically white. I mean, they did spread out from there. I mean, Wojo was, was Polish and they, they actually played on the fact that Polish jokes uh, were very popular during the 60s, you know, that, that so, and there was this ethnic st stereotype of, uh, of Polish individuals being dumb. Well, meathead um, on on meathead, you know, on uh, all in the family. Yeah, yeah. right. Except that that went against type. Remember yeah. that you know, he was smart. you know, in, in other, uh, you know, that he actually was an intellectual, yeah. um, and, and that was in keeping with with the um, all in the families uh, idea of going against prejudice. Um, Barney Miller sort of like played with that in different ways. Um, so. Uh, uh, gee, I'm blanking out of the name Harris. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, that flew in the face of typical uh, depictions of African Americans of this time as being kind of from the ghetto and speaking, you know, in this very, uh, you know, kind of uh, dialect, you know, Black English kind of way, you know, the dynamite. I've been seeing that guy on commercials with <laughs> JJ or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, he's old now doing TV commercials, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it almost anticipates sort of the Cosby show in, in, in that respect. Um, the fact of a, um, of the uh, having a Japanese American was simply unusual, I, and you know, in, um, for that period. I, although, you know, if you jump ahead a little bit, uh, when we get to the '80s, there is a big influx of, of Japanese businessmen, uh, particularly coming into the area uh, because of the economic shifts that were were going on. But I mean, the overall effect was of the melting pot, if you like, you know, which is, again, it's pure New York, where it's not that their ethnic identities were lost, but rather they were very clear in most cases, except for the Jewish part. That was like very subdued. It was rarely brought up, which is also in keeping with a lot of the media industries where they were always very reluctant, probably because so many people running them uh, were Jewish, um, that they were, they, they felt reluctant to play up Jewishness too much. Um, with some exceptions, there was a sitcom, Bridget Loves Bernie, that was about a Jewish Catholic, you know, in, interreligious, uh, you know, marriage. But usually that, that was sort of like kept um, kind, of, kind of subtle. But, but that overall feel, um, and, and um, uh, and there's a sense in which they, there was a lot of going against typecasting or, or count of, I'm sorry, of going against stereotypes in a lot of the depictions, which goes along with the um, more liberal and countercultural view uh, uh, of that time. The very fact that it's in Greenwich Village, which is kind of the center of the counterculture, you know, the place where people are cool. You know, that was where cool was defined on the East Coast, as opposed to hate Ashbury on the, uh, you know, in San Francisco on, on the West Coast. So, of course, the cops there are cool, and, which again just goes completely against the stereotype of police. I, during the 60s and early 70s, the police were the bad guys. They say, you know, the saying pigs off campus. Um, but in, in some ways that almost kind of suggests the movement towards a more conservative outlook, which was embodied when Jimmy Carter became president. You know, although he's thought of as being extremely progressive today, in that moment, 1976, it was, a, it was the start of the turn towards a more cons conservative politics that then just swung wildly when Reagan uh, became president. Well, it should be said, uh, uh, Barney Miller and uh, what was Fish's first name, Phil Fish, 
you know, no, it, no. it's not like it was Fischl and uh, Guildenstern, you know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Rhoda wrote on Mary Tyler Moore was Rhoda Morgenstern, so she was the yes. morning star, you know, she right. was there. Um, let me go, go back to you, Mike, uh, and let's just go uh, uh, briefly through the main characters. We talked about Max Gale's Wojo Howitz, and other than Fish, who got his own show, Wojo was probably the biggest laugh getter uh, there. Oh, yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, about Gale and his character. Well, not only was, uh, yeah, th so much of it was playing on the last name for so long. That was just the joke, you know, it's spelled just like it sounds. But I really felt that he was the heart of the show. I mean, Barney is kind of the brain of the show and Wojo for me was the heart. And so much of the show is him learning acceptance. You know, you're talking, Lance, about this being in the village and Wojo was not the most accepting guy. You know, the, the one episode I remember the most when I was growing up was him arresting somebody for having the American flag on his jeans, I think it was. And it and, right. And Wojo's this ex-Marine, kind of a lunkhead, kind of just not the most progressive guy, really homophobic. But as the show progresses, I think Wojo progresses. And I think really so much of the show is us learning through wojo i think he is he's not the archie bunker of the precinct but he's the guy who's just a little bit out of it and everybody else is a little bit hipper than he is and i'm glad that he is there to kind of show us like that you can change and that you can progress and he goes through a lot of changes he's got love affairs that go on several of memory serves he uh the one of the few um things that comes back quite a few bit, uh, times in the first few seasons is him going for that um exam and he finally makes it and so we get to again see the progression of this character and this was in a time when you didn't carry through very often from one week to the next this is not TV of today where you have a whole season arc you know this is very much these capsule episodes and I really appreciate that they actually do speak back to previous episodes and that they will have ongoing storylines I think right now in season four it's the whole thing about um, Harris trying to get an apartment and he and Dietrich eventually living together for a while and how he cannot stand Dietrich because they're to your point again, Lance, he's an intellectual as well as Dietrich, though Dietrich will not let you forget that he's an intellectual. So, well, it's just also younger. I think yes. that's also, you know, part of it. And he represents, and, and that's the room for growth. I think that's a great point that you're making, Mike, you know, the heart of the show and, and the fact that he's not just a, a dumb person and that's it, but, you know, that. He has that heart and that and openness for growth is a lot very important. Um, yeah, uh, Otto, let me talk. Uh, let's talk about Ron Glass. Uh, he went against stereotypes in the sense that he was real spiffy and a, a dresser, but they didn't go to the pimp stereotype. And there is a sense of of him being prissy and fay. And he later played Felix Unger on the the black version reboot, the new odd couple, a few years after Barney Miller went off. Um, Right. Talk to me about his his performance and his character. Well, um, you know, it's interesting just quickly to, to touch on something Lance had said earlier about this whole melting pot in this in this station house. Believe it or not, when I was reading some of the old reviews, uh, a lot of critics didn't like that. Like they, they kind of demeaned that saying that they were being too obvious about it, which is interesting to look at it now that they're, they were actually complaining about the fact, some, some, to be fair, also said, well, it makes sense because they are reflecting that melting pot of New York. But some actually thought it was overdone and heavy handed, which I think is very funny to think about now. Well, they're, but, all, they're, they're, they're also not on the beat cops, they're detectives. So that's- Right, that's exactly, exactly. Um, Harris, and I, and I don't remember, it was, I think it was Lance who said this too, and I make this point in the book, that if you pay attention in the first few episodes in that first season, Harris does talk with oh, more yeah. of a with more of a ghetto slang to his to his verbiage, basically. 
and as he, you know, as time goes on, he becomes more and more the writer and the intellectual. Um, and I was told by uh, by Danny's sons and by um, actually by a number of people, but they all said that every one of those detectives represented a piece of Danny Arnold's personality. So Jack Sue was the gambler. Well, Danny was a gambler. He owned horses. He owned racehorses. He, there would be times where they couldn't find Danny because he was at the track. Okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, Harris was the guy who liked all the best things in life. He didn't care about whether he had the money or not. That was Danny. Bill, Bill Persky, who was one of the writers on the Dick Van Dyke show, he was good friends with Danny. And he told me, oh, Danny always spent above his means. It didn't matter whether he had it, but he spent it. Um, and, and Wojo, I think, was also that kind of, um, you know, he starts off as that character who sees everything in black and white. And, and certainly through Barney's tutelage, he has to eventually look at the fact, like Mike said, that, you know, he's got to open up and be a little more tolerant and realize that the world around him is not as quite as simple as he thought. Uh, the Harris, I love the fact that Harris, like Mike was saying, I think it was Mike saying, talking about Harris and Dietrich. That oh was a hilarious combination, the two of them. <laughs> just great because Harris was very bright and very smart, but you could almost like before Dietrich comes into the squad room, you could argue that aside from Barney, Harris was the most, the, the most intellectual guy in the room. And then all of a sudden Dietrich comes in and you see that that kind of brought out some insecurity in Harris. Um, it, it, like you're saying, it's just, they, they could have easily been very stereotypical characters, and they were not. Danny made them human and well-rounded. In fact, the only guy who, in a way, left because he felt his character was too stereotypical was Gregory Sierra mm -hmm. with, um, with Chano, because Danny Arnold, and you'll see it later on when he brings in June uh, Gable to play Batista, and you'll even see it in a late series episode with a with a, a superintendent who is Hispanic. He thought Danny thought it was very very funny when Chano would get angry and start talking in Spanish. He thought that was great fun, and and the first time he hired June Gable to do it. He said, well, then when you get there, just get upset and start swearing and, and uh, you know, say something in, in Spanish. And she said to Danny, okay, she says, you're going to have to get me a coach or you're going to have to write it out for me phonetically. And he said, aren't you Hispanic? Aren't you Puerto Rican? And she says, no, I'm Eastern European. But he had seen her on Broadway in the play The Ritz, and she had played a Hispanic character, so he assumed she was Hispanic. So, and Sierra kind of left because he didn't want to get stuck in that, in that very stereotypical role of the, of the fiery, passionate Hispanic, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, didn't he also leave uh, Sanford and Son to go on to Barney Miller? From what I was told, I think he got like a, a holding deal from ABC and they promised him his own series. Uh -huh. and, and apparently... I can't remember if this was Max or Hal who told me this, but they felt that he had been told by ABC, we don't have anything for you yet. Go into this show and we'll, we'll develop something for you. Yeah. So then after two years, he kind of said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he left. Eventually, he did get his own show created and produced by Danny Arnold um, called AES Hudson Street. Oh, and God. sadly, it only lasted like six episodes. I actually thought it was kind of funny. It was basically Barney Miller in an emergency room, hmm. essentially. Um, yeah. And it should be stated that the Ron Glass character was also the artist of the bunch. He blood on the bed, his, his uh, memoir <laughs> come, come Mickey Spillane kind of attempt. Uh, right. Uh, and, but, and just quickly, you mentioned something about how unusual it was for a Japanese character. The reality is of all those people that were in that show, Jack Sue was an old friend 
of Danny Arnold because they had both been nightclub comics in the late 40s and early 50s and had met on the road, like in the Midwest in various clubs. And Jack Sue, of course, his real name was Goro Suzuki. And he had changed his name to a Chinese name because he had been put in an internment camp during World War II. And so he, when he came out, he had to have a Chinese name because, you know, believe it or not, kids back then, we were allies with China. And um, he wants to change his name. He's all excited in the late 50s because he gets a role in uh, a musical called Flower Drum Song. And he's all excited because he figures, now I can go back to my real name and become Goro Suzuki. And the producer said, no, it's supposed to be based in a Chinese nightclub. We already have two Korean women in it. We need you to stay, keep your Jap or your uh, Chinese name. <laughs> so when he goes on Barney, it was very important to him that his character was Japanese. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah. Now, I, I would just point to that, that, um, you know, in this period of time, there are still lots of folks, you know, kind of in the, their middle, middle-aged folks who were around during World War II. And I mean, I remember from uh, adults when I was growing up, you know, there are people who would never, ever buy anything made in Japan. Yeah. I, you know, that they carried that grudge of Pearl Harbor uh, to, to their dying day. And the same thing about never buying anything made in Germany, um, yeah. which, um, you know, created a certain amount of friction when we got to the point where Japanese and German cars were, were uh, kind of <laughs> so popular. Uh, well, Lance, let me talk uh, to you then about a couple of the older characters, the Phil Fish character played by Abe Vigoda, and I guess he uh, rode the fame of the, the Godfather to get that role, and then also James Gregory, who was a really great character actor for the prior 30 years, and he plays the, he's not in every episode, uh, but he plays the cranky, crotchety old guard who's constantly remembering the good old days. So uh, if you, Lance, we could talk about both of those older characters. Well, uh, you know, I guess that's Luger. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, they, I mean, Luger is very much the foil for Barney Miller. Um, and, you know, there's the tension. It, it's not as much on display as it is in, in All in the Family, but the tension between, you know, the kind of the older generation and, and Barney Miller, although he's not that young, I still represents, you know, as does his... Uh, uh, everyone but uh, but fish, um, pretty much, and well, it, um, you know, rep represents a kind of younger approach to to things, and the more tolerant kind of view that's emerging out of the out of out of the sixties. Um, so that that's very much on people's minds. I you know, we talked about the generation gap that existed. At, uh, at that point, um, which is much wider. I mean, today, you know, you might say, oh, there are digital natives and digital immigrants, and, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, oh, those millennials or Generation Z or whatever. But that big gap doesn't exist the way it did. I mean, we do talk about the culture wars less in terms of age today as between the red states and the blue states. But but in a lot of ways, Luger in particular, more so than Fish, but you know, represents that those culture wars um, and gives uh, Barney Miller something to kind of stand up to, I think, in, in a well, lot of ways. Well, Lance, you know, I, I grew up in New York uh, with a lot of corrupt police departments and whatnot, and to me, Luger's yeah. character is, in a sense, the most realistic cop. I mean, there's plenty of episodes where it said, come on, Barney, just take him out back and give him the old business. Uh, or, you know, he said, you know, someone, you know, he'd see the two gay guys that we'll talk about in a little bit in, in, in the general. What are you, couple of degenerates? You know, or some, some comment yeah. like that. So, I mean, he, yeah. in a sense, he, he is that, I mean, I don't know, is Lug I guess Luger would be a German name, but he is that Irish kind of cop mentality. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds a lot like Trump. If you think about it, I, uh, you know, speaking of German names, because that's, you know, it was changed from the German, but, uh, 
but but yeah, I, I mean that was something you know that was a kind of undercurrent and and attention uh, that existed through throughout the culture, but was there. I mean, you, you're right that that I mean Archie Bunker and all in the family. I mean, although he was portrayed as a typical wasp, really represented an Irish Catholic uh, kind of identity. You know, in terms of of New Yorkers, uh, and again, you know specifically to an older generation. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, again, Luger has that. I think Fish has less of that. He, uh, just be, and again, it's that, that relates to his ethnicity, you know, and, and the same thing with, with Frank Sue's uh, character. You know, the more ethnic they are, the less they're going to be kind of in your face about uh, being, uh, you know, kind of, conservative and, and and talking about that but I, I mean you're right that's that was the real police force um, I mean to some extent it remains you know just nationally uh, the problematic aspect of, of police culture but I, you know the, I think it, that's also a stereotype and, and uh, there was a, an attempt to counter that stereotype but also New York police, uh, and the NYPD, while they weren't the most progressive group in New York, uh, and certainly had to be more progressive and more open than folks in uh, other parts of the country. I mean, back when, when Ed Koch was mayor, they, they practically de facto legalized marijuana in, in New York so that people were not being arrested. You know, and the police were part of that. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, I think he still represents a kind of old guard that was on its way out and is being depicted as being kind of like old and in the way, if you like, you know, and that's where like, you know, reminiscing about the old days is a sign that you're no longer, which is, I guess, what we're doing here, is a sign <laughs> that you're no longer like in, in the now, you know, you're no longer current. And was Vagoda really the breakout, Mike, you can take this, was Vagoda really the breakout star? Is that why he got his show? Is yeah, definitely. I was going to, real quick on Lance's point, the thing about Luger is that he was always kind of toothless. He never really had, he was just, he was a figure for fun. And he would come in and say ridiculous things and get Wojohowicz's name wrong. And eventually, you know, eventually makes it to the opening credits and shows up occasionally, but he's mostly there just to be the dumb guy. It was interesting to me that Scanlon is the only one who really is a threat to the uh, precinct, you know, and he's the internal affairs guy and he's always trying to get Bernie, but Luger was always, you know, at first I found him to be very annoying, but then he kind of becomes much more endearing as he comes in and you're just waiting for Luger to come in misunderstand the situation, come up with a couple quips, talk about how that waitress over at the diner, she, you know, had it coming to her kind of thing, and then off he goes. But yeah, I, I really appreciated Luger as as the years went on. And uh, yeah, and then Scan was just always such a SOB that you just hated whenever he showed up. Well, George Murdoch did a great job. George oh, Murdoch yeah. as Scanlon was the equivalent of the guy on Nash uh, flag. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Colonel right. Flag. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, I do, did want to get back, though, to Jack Sue for a moment, because um, speaking of stereotype, he's the opposite of the, the Asian stereotype. He's slovenly. He's not the brightest. He's uh, he gambles. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to have any kind of real life outside policing and, and gambling. And and yet and yet the. Uh, he, he's also very funny, and I, I did, before I did this uh, this show on Barney Miller, the previous show I profiled was Bob, the Bob Newhart show, and there's a famous scene, the Boo Goo Guy Pan scene in Bob Newhart, where they're this, and then there's the famous brownie, hash brownies scene. Is that the probably still oh, the favorite God. episode on Barney Miller? Yeah, I think that has to be the, the best. I have not laughed so hard at <laughs> anything in so long. Oh, my and, God. And doesn't Nick go like, mushy, mushy, Bob? Mushy, mushy. <laughs> Has anybody seen my legs? They're about this long. <laughs> His deadpan delivery. Oh, my God. Just, you're waiting for Nick to come in with the quip because you know it's going to be good. And there was that episode where he was cooking something authentically Japanese. 
<laughs> and he starts talking about the ingredients. Well, you got fish heads and uh, meals. <laughs> right? It's just all, oh, it tastes like garbage. And then eventually, oh, it is garbage. <laughs> Oh man, so good. Oh, I, I I love his character. He is just he brings such a freshness to it. Every single time he says something, it is great. And he gets away with a lot of great digs on characters just because he is so deadpan. Yeah. Now uh, a couple of other characters that came on and became regulars later. I want to talk about them. Uh, the first one is Ron Carey as uh, uh, Levitt, and uh, he's he's the the Napoleon complected uh, uh, guy who's, who's trying to make it as a detective. And he's really the only on the beat cop that we really see. Although I guess maybe he's easy. He, does he run the mail room or what, what, what is, what is he? At, well, at, at the beginning, we saw officer Kogan, right. Uh, who was played by a, an actor, a guy named Milt Kogan. So they, they just named the character after the actor. Um, and he was on, I don't know, maybe three, four, five episodes, something like that. And then, um, and then you have Levitt introduced in the uh, at bottle episode where they're there because they think that they might have smallpox. And that's right. what they're introduced to Levitt. I, I believe that's the opening show of season three. And right, because he had just played a villain in season two, exactly. uh, the mole. Le- yeah. The mole, Angelo the Mole Molinari. <laughs> and Levitt, like Steve Landisberg, both they both played criminals that had been brought into the into the into the uh, station house first. And um then after Levitt, once Levitt starts coming up and down, you know, sometimes he's he's filling in for people who aren't there, then they eventually introduce Officer Zatelli, yeah. and Zatelli is basically doing what Levitt used to do. He delivers the reports. He delivers the mail. Was Zatelli the gay character? Yes, he was the gay character. And it, you know, I said in the book, you know, a lot of people, some people liked the character of Marty and Daryl and thought it was progressive for the time. Mm-hmm. Others thought it wasn't very progressive. It was kind of just a typical, stereotypical. Yeah. Although there weren't a lot of just stereotypical gay characters in right. 1975. But but Zatelli <coughs> comes off as, you know, a capable police officer, yeah. you know? Um, and uh, and he wants, he, he lets Barney know he's gay, but he doesn't want, you know, internal affairs. He doesn't want Scanlon to get a hold of it because he knows what'll happen. Yeah. But, um, but Levitt, you know, I know, I don't know, I don't think Mike and his partner Chris have quite crossed over yet to like. Not him. yet, not yet. Um, we're we're getting close though. the The last couple episodes, he's been a little bit more bearable. But well, that is another thing. You know, earlier on, uh, Dan, you mentioned uh, Car Fifty Four. Yeah. And I said the only two predecessors that I pointed out in the book to Barney Miller were Car Fifty Four. And in a sense, the Andy Griffith show. Uh-huh. And although Andy Griffith was smart, he was a smart cop. Barney was, I mean, the whole point of Barney was that he was an apt, um, as was Gunther Tootie. You mean, Bar- you mean Barney Ford. Fife, not Barney Miller. Right, Barney Fife, yeah. excuse me, right. Barney Fife <laughs> on, um, on, on the Andy Too Griffith. many Barneys. Yeah, was inept. And, and so was Joey Ross, who's Gunther Tootie on Car 54. And when you get to, to Barney Miller, what you see is, like Mike said, all these characters, they're definitely idiosyncratic, but the reality is they are all good cops. Mm. Um, even, you see as, as, the, as the series goes on, even Levitt. Mm. I mean, there's a, there's a number of times that Levitt will be shown doing his job very well. Um, so you, to the point that near the end, you almost get, you almost start siding with him against Barney. Like really Barney, what is the problem? Why can't you advance him? And it's, um, you know, I, people ask me who my favorite character is and I really mean it. I do. I loved all the characters. I thought they were all real. I thought they were all very real people. In terms of laughter, 
the two characters that always made me laugh the most, and that is because their styles were similar, were Jack Sue and Steve Landisberg. Mm. Uh, I thought, even when I was a kid, I thought Dietrich was about one of the funniest characters oh, I had ever loved seen. Dietrich. Oh, yeah. He's great. Well, D- Dietrich yeah. was, in a sense, a precursor to Cliff Clavin, except Cliff Clavin is dumb in a Silas, and, Landy, <laughs> and, and Dietrich actually is smart, Although there are some times when he doesn't have an answer and he'll 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 do, just cut off the scent with just a, and I think he, one one time he even says like go jump in a lake or something. <laughs> <laughs> but but on Levitt, you know, I just want to note that that is a Jewish name. Yeah. Uh, so once again, we have you know, I mean, that's actually the third character that has a Jewish identity, and and you know, for me watching it, I mean. That's the one that stood out for me as, you know, the, you know this guy has to be Jewish. Um, you know, so it, it, it's just interesting the, the extent to which that is showing up in, on, the, on the program. And at the same time, you know, the, the typical kind of casting that you would find on TV and in movies was basically Jewish and Italian. Those two, you know, two ethnicities are interchangeable. Um, but, you know, in, in this case, um, I, isn't the, the fellow who played Levitt, wasn't he Irish, actually? Yeah, Ron Carey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so again, you know, it's just Wait like... Going, yeah. Ron Carey was not his real name. Oh, no? Uh, his real name was Ronald Cicenia. He was uh, one of my guys. He's Italian. Uh, okay. okay. All right. Well, then, not, not so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was so, very much... He was a New Jersey Italian. So okay. uh, let's let's talk about a couple of other minor characters, and then we'll move on to some of the the themes and best episodes and and whatnot. Um, uh, we we mentioned uh, briefly Gregory Sierra and how he was dissatisfied, I guess, or mutually dissatisfaction. We mentioned Scanlan, who I I love the way Murdoch would always pull up his belt, and I think that what, wasn't there one show where he goes, "What is this? There's, there's no corruption here," and he, you, you can see he's so let down that they're honest cops. He can't believe it. Uh, but the two characters, I mentioned Paul Lieber and his, his character Dorsey was on for, I think, one season. And a few seasons before, Linda Lavin, before she got Alice, played Wentworth, which was sort of the token female character. Uh, let me start with you, Mike. What is your take on both of those uh, characters and why were they eventually dropped? Obviously, Lavin got her own show. Right, right. right. Though I loved Wentworth. I really appreciated her and that... She kind of comes off very strong uh, at first, like too strong kind of thing. Like, oh, it's because I'm a woman. Da, 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 da. And she gets really upset about things. And Barney's just like, I, I think Barney actually is a little bit sexist. And he's proven to be wrong about that, which I really uh, like that he is a big enough person to realize that he has been keeping her in the station house and not sending her out as much as he should be. Uh, and then once he does, she proves that she is a really capable cop. And I also appreciate it, even though, you know, it could have been stereotypical that she, you know, eventually becomes a love interest. But that relationship, that kind of give and take between her and Wojo, really like that. I mean, talk about fire and, and ice with, with that relationship. I, I dug that a lot. I kind of wish that she was still around. Yeah, she got Alice and more power to her. Um, she would have just been a number, another member of the station had she stayed around the, the one too, but man, she was great. I really, really dug her. And I do like, um, I'm sure Otto knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, I love how she's still mentioned in later episodes. And that's one thing I appreciate is that you still get to see people's names up on the board or they might get a mention every now and again, because She's been gone with my rewatch of this. She's been gone for at least a season, but they just threw out her name in the last episode. It's like, oh, well, what about Wentworth? And they mentioned a few other cops and it's like, oh yeah, that was the other African-American from the first season that we haven't seen in three seasons, but they still mention these guys. Well, they so, all work yeah. on the same shift. And if you work shift work, you, you talk about people, you know, that guy on, on night shift did this and, you know. Right. Exactly. And yeah, you got always got the board where they're signing in and moving the the, the, the piece to show that they're in, which I uh, also appreciate. So you get to see who the other cops are that are working in that precinct. 
So uh, Lance, uh, let, let's talk about that. Uh, we, we so we set up the, the premise and, and the main characters. Um, I mentioned, and I should say, there is a really terrific video about Barney Miller and the two gay characters that you mentioned by a fellow named Matt Baum. Uh, it's a really good uh, a video about uh, how the network handled that. But uh, um, what were some of the major, uh, uh, if not arcs, uh, social issues that were first dealt with uh, in this series, especially early on, the first couple of years, uh, Lance? Well, uh, I, I think, you know, policing itself, I mean, it's so much of an issue today. Um, and, and one of the big shifts... It would have been easy, easy enough in a comedy to just have bad guys and, you know, let the bad guys be, you know, villainous or just, you know, be greedy, you know, whatever the motivations are, you know, that we tip, typically ascribe to, um, to people who are, you know, bad or, you know, immoral. But instead, this is a kind of a prevailing um, <clears throat> movement come, again coming out of the 60s was to explain criminality as more of a, a psychological issue, a mental health issue, um, and to focus on rehabilitation in prisons rather than punishment. Uh, and I think that the series really rode that wave in the sense that it was, you know, the, that the people that were being brought in were, I mean, all, they were almost never just common criminals who were just doing it out of some kind of negative, you know, uh, evil, you know, inclination. You know, they were people who were troubled. I mean, you know, they maybe played for laughs that they had these issues or these foibles, but they were also treated, you know, to this day, this is how we would want police to act, you know, is to be sympathetic to be, you know, almost therapeutic and, and not be confrontational or, or, or just, you know, uh, aggressive and defensive, you know, uh, in the way that they treat people. Um, so there was this very kind of generous spirit uh, coming into it. I, you know, they didn't really go that far in acknowledging the social issues behind things, you know, that, you know, we understand, you know, problems like poverty, um, but that was an undercurrent as well. So I, I think that that, you know, probably more than anything else, that was a kind of powerful sensibility running through the entirety uh, of the program and then folded into it where the ability to deal here and there with issues like prejudice, um, like uh, feminism, you know, so we're talking about with Wentworth really, uh, you know, that was a kind of novel thing. I mean, you may remember the um, action show Police Woman with Angie Dickinson, you know, I mean, that, that was like, you know, this big thing. Um, but, you know, they dealt with it in, in this very, you know, kind of, you know, not, not, not this totally confrontational or angry kind, kind of way. Um, and, you know, this was brought up before, having gay characters there's always this give and take. So it's not, it's never like one or the other, you know, it's incredibly progressive to just have characters of that sort, but in a way to make it palatable and safe for this mainstream audience, they also have to invoke kind of stereotypes and, and, um, you know, almost, you know, turn it into a kind of, of joke, uh, uh, rather than get overly serious and, um, and, and too progressive in that depiction. But the fact that they broke that ground um, is very significant as well. Well, they didn't have ever the, the sort of uh, staple of, of real dramatic cop shows. I, I don't recall there ever being a serial killer or a child right. molester, pedophile. There was never any uh, high-ranking mob boss. There might have been some foot soldier that they occasionally brought in. Uh, was that, uh, and I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, um, Otto, was that a deliberate that they didn't want to do the same kind of, oh, here's, here's the, the, gang, the gang leader, here's, here's the, I, mean, I guess they had a cult leader one, once or twice, but uh, the, the choice of what kind of criminals were brought in, what was, what was their basis for that? Well, um, to kind of piggyback on things that both Mike and Lance said, you know, Danny's, uh, 
my interpretation of the of the overriding point of the whole show, and I think this is what Danny was was trying to get across because it it plays throughout, and it's exactly what we're all talking about right now. His idea was to show the human condition. Mm-hmm. That was more important to Danny than to sh- you know showing you a serial killer or some of the some of the really ugly things that may have been happening in New York City uh, at the time. And in fact, someone just said, I think it was Lance just said, this is how we'd like police to act. Well, Danny literally said to his actors before they started doing the show, he's like, when you're doing your role, I want you to think how you'd want a cop to be if you had to go into a precinct and report a crime. How would you want to be treated? I mean, he literally said that to them. So Lance hit it right on the head. I mean, that's, that was very important to Danny. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> I said at one point in the book, I said, I didn't want to get very political and, you know, in a book about a TV comedy, but this is a show that with everything that's going on in 2022 with police across America, they should really be showing these episodes to, to the police because, <laughs> You know, the, the whole point, Barney Miller says it to his men more than once during the course of the series where he expects them to treat everybody with respect, even the criminals, mm-hmm. like not respect, but you, but you can't treat them like animals. You know, uh, there's one line in it at some point where um, uh, Wojo says, well, She's not much of a witness, Byron. She's a hooker. And Barney, and Barney says to him, well, they have been known to see things before. <laughs> so it, his whole point was always to treat these people with respect. And in terms of the, like, what kind of crimes they were showing, I think the other thing that was important to Danny, and he must have known what he was talking about, because ultimately Barney Miller is the show that, more policemen cite as being the most realistic show about police ever on TV. And that is because what they showed on Barney Miller was the mundane nature of the job. They showed the, you know, all the red tape and the bureaucracy. Oh my God, bureaucracy, the the futility of dealing within that bureaucratic system came up constantly throughout the series all the time um i mean one of the things that got me interested in writing a book about it because like i said i was always a fan but years ago i saw a a talk show and um dennis farina dennis farina who was a great character actor well dennis farina had been a, a chicago police officer for 19 years before he became an actor. And he's on this talk show, and the guy, the host asked him, he says, what's the most realistic cop show ever? And he says, well, I'm gonna tell you, but you're gonna think I'm joking, and I'm not. He said, Barney Miller. And the guy's like, you're kidding. He says, no. He said, it shows how how tedious the day-to-day work can be. He says, you know, you watch these cop shows where every week, they're shooting 20 or 30 people. He said, I was on the Chicago police force for 19 years and I discharged my weapon twice. Mm -hmm. So that was really important to Danny. I think was, it wasn't so much about what the crimes were that they were depicting. It was very much for him about depicting the human condition and, and how we treat one another. Yeah. Well, so many of the episodes, they resolve the crime inside of the station, which I love. Like so, so few people actually get moved up to the next level of the the system, you know. And and maybe you get taken away to Bellevue, which you know you you had, uh, you know, <laughs> the mental uh, facilities back in the day. This is pre Reagan, after all, but. It was uh, amazing just how many times Barney is able to sort things out and and use that red tape against 
the system sometimes as well. It's like, well, you could do this and it's going to cost you so much money and take so long. And you'll know, you know, he hit, there was the lawyer character that, uh, was that Stuart Pinkin uh, played? Uh, no, uh, Alex Henteloff. Thank you. The Arnold Ripken. Right, right. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, you can do that, but it's going to take all this time. And yeah, yeah. so he was able to, to use the red tape against the system and, and able to, to diffuse a lot of things. And that's so much. I mean, Barney is uh, the perfect dad as well, as far as just like right. able to take the, the fighting kids and sort out who's going to get the toy i mean sometimes literally who's going to get the toy that... <laughs> right and, and another thing that made the show different and i think you alluded to it earlier mike was this was not your normal show like you're saying how often barney would resolve it within the station and how did he do that well eventually i don't know if you've gotten to this point yet but there's an episode where dietrich calls barney out and says I like how you do that. And Barney's like, do what? He says, I notice you always put the two litigants together so that they can talk it out themselves. And Barney's like, well, yeah, I figure that's a better idea. And, and he says that way they can resolve with themselves. And Dietrich says, yeah, or beat the hell out of one another. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the, the point about bureaucracy, I, and, and this is where we get into kind of the fantasy part of it, though, um, is that a lot of the dissatisfaction with policing in this time period was not as, I mean, there was a big problem with, with police brutality regarding protests and so forth. Um, but it was also the sense that they were ineffective um, right. and overly bureaucratic, um, you know, because during the uh, 70s and, and into the 80s, cram crime was a major problem in the United States. And there was a sense that the police just didn't care, um, you know, that, that they would just say, oh, fill out a form and there's nothing we can do about it. We'll never find the killer or never recover the stolen goods. Um, I don't know if, you know, the, if you go to the film, The Terminator from 1984, um, the, the, the last point where people actually like the Terminator before they realize he's a, you know, he's uh, a monster is when he drives into the police station right after, you know, he's, he goes into the police station and he gets treated in this bureaucratic, unsympathetic way. That's the last, and, and then just like drives right into it, destroying it. And that's the last point where the audience goes, yeah, right? Because where everyone is really ticked off about, about the way the police behave. And that's the opposite again, you know, that we see in, in uh, Barney Miller that they're working against the bureaucracy rather than being sort of functionaries of that, that bureaucracy. Um, and maybe that also speaks to being in Greenwich Village. I, you know, I think that's right. part of it too. Well, and they're also in danger of losing their jobs. Very often those, in those first few seasons, you get that, what was it, four to New York City drop dead kind of thing. Yeah. And you even get, I think you get uh, Ford's voice on the TV in one episode as well. Just like, yeah, you guys are going to lose all your funding. And there's several times where they are almost going to get fired or people will get moved to other precincts and they're very afraid of losing their jobs or losing the job at the one too. And who was it who came from another? Was it Dietrich came Dietrich, from another precinct? Dietrich, yeah. Dietrich came Which from was, the 33rd. They closed down the 33rd precinct. That's right. Yeah, and that's how they close the, the show is uh, that the 12th precinct gets closed down. Mm. Right. Spoilers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one thing I did want to mention, though, uh, it's often said, as, as you mentioned, uh, Otto, that uh, a lot of police cite it as most realistic. But I have to say, I worked in a courtroom around the turn of the century in Minneapolis. I grew up in New York. I worked in Hennepin County where the, the recent stuff with uh, uh, George Floyd happened. And it's also without the corruption and the blatant racism because most of the white cops, both in New York and Minneapolis, the N-word flies regularly. Oh. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, let's, let's pause right here. We're at 33 and then we'll do another, you know, longer segment and then we'll wrap up. So. It was mentioned earlier, the television show MASH, uh, and they had a unique setup where uh, uh, that is in common with Barney Miller in that 
The coming and goings of actors with, is easily explained, uh, unlike a lot of other sitcoms. In, you know, people get transferred into different troops or, or, or bases or whatnot. And in Barney Miller, the same thing. So it's very easy to write out a character. Like Fish goes and he's going to run a, a group home for wayward kids. Uh, Gregory Sierra, I forget what they did with him. Wentworth comes and goes. Uh, Dietrich comes. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the departure of Jack Sue via death. Um, because uh, I know they had a special episode for him. So they did in... In universe, did they? How did they? I forget. How did they acknowledge? Was Nick killed in the line of duty, or how? No. In fact, um, Hal Linden told me that when when Nick uh, when uh, Jack Sue died, um, Hal suggested to Danny Arnold. He said, "Well, maybe we could do a thing where Nick was sick, and and he wouldn't. T he didn't tell anybody. He only told me." He only told Barney and he didn't want me to tell the other guys. And then he dies. And Danny Arnold said, no, he says, I don't want to in any way exploit Jack's death. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And then when they got to the end of the season, he just made the, the, the choice to do a, a rare show where they come out of character and they just talk and a, a, Apparently, he told them all, prepare something and work it out among yourself, but just say what you feel about him, and we'll show some clips interspersed with that. What, what they did the following season, because that was the end of the fifth season, what they did the following season is there is an episode where, because they, haven't, they don't really talk about it, but then there's an episode where they come in and the, the custodial staff or the superintendent, whatever, has come in and they have removed Nick's desk. Uh -huh. yeah. And Barney said, says something like, oh, you know, I put that request in so long ago, I forgot about it, I'm sorry. And they talk about how it leaves a void in the room and they, they insinuate that Nick is dead but they don't ever say how he died or what happened to him or anything like that. But they do acknowledge that Nick did not go to another precinct. He went to that big precinct in the sky, basically. Mm. So so did um, they ever toy with the idea of bringing back Vagoda? Because his, his uh, spinoff tank, but I, from what I've read, didn't Vagoda leave on pretty bad terms? Uh, yes. He and Danny, um, by the time we go to left, he and Danny were not getting along. Uh, Danny was upset because there were a couple times that I guess uh, Vagoda had gone to other tapings, like a guest spot on a variety show or a, a, seriously, a, um, a Dean Martin roast one time and left Danny in the lurch and Danny got really ticked off about it and said so in the press in variety. And you have to remember, I, I think I told this to Mike and his partner, Chris, on their show, but as we said earlier, as we alluded to earlier, no one expected this cranky old Jewish cop to be the breakout character of this show. I mean, he, uh, Vigoda had been an actor for about 25 years in New York before The Godfather, and most of his relatives wouldn't have been able to pick him out of a crowd. And then he gets The Godfather, and all of a sudden, everybody knows his face, and then he becomes the big hit on this show. And from everything I could gather, and the people I spoke with, uh, he kind of let it go to his head a little bit. Yeah. At one point in the second season, or maybe it was even before the second season started, he suggested to, to uh, Danny Arnold that they change the name of the show to Barney and Fish. <laughs> and Danny was not going to have that. And, and in fact, there's an episode which I think is season two. I think it's near the end of season two where they introduce the Dietrich character. That episode where you go into Fish's apartment was supposed to be the the spinoff episode, you know, the pilot for the for the fish spinoff, 
but the executives ended up not liking it. And they said, we have to come up with a different idea. So he didn't leave yet. So he ends up staying another year. But, but Danny was trying to get rid of him by season two. And, and then because he burned so many bridges and this, I got, I, I heard mixed stories on this. So you don't really know what the, the true story is, but some people said that he did want to come back afterwards. And Danny was like, no way, you, you know, you were tired, you're not coming back. And uh, he came, he did, I believe, two or three episodes uh, after he left the show as like, you know, he was retired and he came back to see how the guys were doing or whatever. And in fact, the last time he was on, he, he Wojo asked him, how's the the thing going with the kids because they were he and Bernice were running like a, a halfway house or something for those kids those orphan kids and he's like oh the the uh the city ran out of the money so we're not doing that anymore so the kids are gone and that's it that's how they basically ended Fisher's story yeah. so he might have wanted to come back but Danny was not going to have him back after that well, if that the show hadn't bombed, we never would have gotten the mortal phrase. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, the, I, I think I said this to Mike um, before. The, the fish premise was so bad. I mean, it was just bad. I, I said again, why wouldn't you? I always thought it would have made sense to have fish retire and go become like a security guard in an office or a bank or another place where you can have these loony characters come in. Keep in mind, one of Danny Arnold's, he had two young writers who worked for him that everyone around the set used to call them Danny's Golden Boys. <laughs> and that was Tony Sheehan and Reinhold Wiggy. Well, Reinhold Wiggy went and created a show called Night Court, which was basically... Barney Miller, but in a night court. A little bit more so, over the top than Barney Miller, though. It was yeah. much more oh, much yeah. more slapstick and much more, yeah, much more. And I think it's a great show. It's a balls-to-the-wall right. comedy, where this is more reserved comedy. But as to your point, I wanted to bring up, as to your point about the fish premise, you said you're, you're a New Yorker as well? I'm, I'm a New Yorker, but I'm not a New Yorker. Okay. I live in Rochester, New York. Okay, because if I don't know if you've been there all your life, but in the 1970s, there was a big thing called CETA, C-E-T-A, which was a Comprehensive Employment Training Act in which young children uh, or teenagers were going around, because I my mom worked at a, a senior center and I would be there helping out and I'd meet these kids. Uh, so there were a lot of these kinds of things where, where the city and the state of New York were actively trying to help young people from underprivileged circumstances. So it was a realistic premise. Uh, a lot of right. them were a lot of, so I mean, it, I don't think, it, it might oh, have I been didn't... not executed well, but I don't think the premise was necessarily terrible. No, no, no. I don't mean the premise was unrealistic. I just meant that I don't, it didn't make, I didn't, it didn't really make sense for, for Fish, in my opinion, because it was a one joke premise, yeah. which, which is introduced in Barney, and that is that he doesn't like kids. Right. <laughs> So it, it seemed to me like more of a, a, a 60s sitcom premise. It was this one joke that kind of had to carry the series along, you know? Yeah. I mean, Fish himself was kind of, well, he was kind of two jokes. You know, he was the, his bowels, and it was how much he disliked Bernice. And after a while, it was just like, okay, enough with the wife jokes, you know, especially because Bernice was a very nice person. So it's like, quit making fun of her. Well, it was, it was the Henny Youngman era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the book, Mike, you will appreciate it. somewhere in there, I don't know where it is, but I list, I give you the list of all of Fish's ailments that he talked about through the years. <laughs> Didn't he have like diverticulitis once or something? He had everything. <laughs> he had Which is everything. very Jewish, by the way. So. <laughs> <Hypochondria>. <laughs> so let's talk about the end of the show, both in universe and out. Did Dan, is it true Danny Arnold wanted the show? Uh, he's the one that ended it. It wasn't ABC. He did, yes. In fact, what happened was at the end of season five, um, Danny had to go and have open heart surgery. He, in those first five seasons, he basically gave up his life for this show. Uh, there were people said that there were nights that he just slept 
uh, in the office. And he really, some people, a lot of people actually thought that he really hurt his own health by, by how hard he worked on that, on that show. So at the end of season five, like I said, Tony Sheehan and Reinhold Winky were his two lieutenants, for lack of a better word. And he called Sheehan in and he says, I'm not going to be here next year. He's like, the doctor, I'm having open heart surgery. And the doctor told me I have to step away for a while. Can you handle it? And Tony Sheehan said to him, sure, Danny, Reiny and I can handle it. No problem. And he's like, no, he's like, Reiny just signed a deal with Warner. So he's leaving as well. Mm. So at the end of season five, both Reinhold Wiggy and Danny Arnold left. And it was left to Tony Sheehan. And he eventually hires these two guys named um, Frank Dungan and Jeff Stein. And basically, the three of them were really the heart and soul of the writing staff for season six and seven. After season seven, Tony had had enough because uh, it was high pressure. And, and by the way, Tony Sheehan, it's amazing to me, but he told me, Barney Miller was his first job out of college. So he was a kid when he started on it. And um, so he wanted to walk away after season seven. And apparently he made the mistake of saying, you know, Danny said something to the, to the cast and crew with me there in front of all of them that we were going to finish it at the end of season seven. He's like, you know, they wanted to keep going because they're making money and stuff like that. And what happened was Ted Flicker, you remember Ted Flicker, the supposed co-creator, uh, had already through the first seven years of the show been constantly suing Danny Arnold over profits. And they were count and Danny was counter suing him and all these things. So they were they were in constant litigation, uh, Flicker and Arnold. So at the end of season seven, Danny was gonna hang up the cleats and and Flicker said went to court and said, he's doing this to lessen my residuals so that the, there's less profits for me to get. So Danny finally decided he would do one more season and he would take over after Tony left and he would keep Dungan and Stein on. And then actually what happened when they do the final trilogy in season eight, he actually asked Tony Sheehan to come back and help them write it. So Sheehan, Dungan, Stein, and Danny uh, wrote that that final trilogy that finishes up the program. But yeah, he took it off the air after eight seasons. And by the way, Alan Alda could have learned something from him. Um, because, you know, the, the, like you say, MASH could easily explain people coming and going. It was harder to explain them aging 12 years yeah. in front of our <laughs> eyes for a two-year police action. So, right. And also, also to MASH, as great a show as it was, probably has, I would say, the lowest success rate of, of consistently good episodes. I mean, there are some abysmal episodes in the first few years when they were still doing the, the Asian stereotypes and stuff. And then the last few years when it, it, it got a little bit self-indulgent. Uh, so uh, shows like The Odd Couple, which was only five years and they ended it, uh, uh, Bob Newhart, which went only six years, Mary, Tyler Moore, seven years, they, they didn't jump the shark, as the old saying goes. Exactly. And, and just to speak to something Lance said near the beginning, I didn't mean to leave Mary Tyler Moore out when I mentioned All in the Family and MASH. The reason I excluded it is because Mary was another show, as far as I was concerned, like Barney, that remained funny throughout its seven-year run. Yeah. I mean, Mary, was, Mary Tyler Moore's show was always brilliantly funny. Always. So let's talk about the afterlife of the show, uh, both uh, critically and also it was mentioned earlier that it wasn't, it's not like The Odd Couple. In the 1980s, The Odd Couple is everywhere. Gilligan's Island and I Love Lucy and The Honeymooners have run for 60, 70 years. Uh, but Barney Miller, I mean, yes, we've, I guess it's been on assorted, uh, you know, substations and cable stations. Um, why, I mean, is it still, do you think, an underrated show that's often forgotten when people talk about the greatest sitcoms? Uh, let me start with you, Mike. Well, it's not like we're tearing up the charts with uh, our Barney Miller podcast, and it's not like uh, uh, 
there were other Barty Miller podcasts before ours. You know, we're also doing one on Columbo and we're like, you know, the, 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 the tagline is yet another Columbo podcast because there are so darn many. There's not a lot of Barney Miller podcasts. I think there's a couple episodes here and there of people just kind of like this, where it's like, okay, we're going to talk about Barney Miller, but it's not not as popular as I think it could be. And I don't. I think there's still some name recognition, but I you talk to my 20, 30 year old coworkers, they're going to have no idea who Barney Miller is, unfortunately. Is it because none of the actors ever became bigger, so to speak? That's a, that's a really good point. I'm not sure if that's the reason or if it just, it was so much, because I can't even say that it was a product of the time because it is very timeless. I don't find myself having to explain all of the jokes. You know, I've got a, a you know, I'll just mention my uh, younger co-host co uh, on there, Chris Nashu. Occasionally I'll be like, okay, here's a little bit of color commentary of what, what was happening at the time but I don't have to do that all the time. So it's not like it's this time capsule that people couldn't understand today. It's, it is like your Andy Griffiths or your car 54s where these jokes do transcend time. So I'm not sure if it's that, you know, people are like, Oh, uh, what else did, uh, how Lyndon do, but that, that's a very good point. Uh, Dan, I think, I think you're right, Dan. I think that is one of the reasons because this was, uh, a true ensemble show mm -hmm. and but like you say none of these people became huge major <clears throat> excuse me huge major stars i mean hal linden won a tony award right before he did barney miller for the rothschild so he was very big he was a big broadway star um but max gale this was really his first starring role ron glass had done guest spots but this was his first uh, starring role Gregory Sierra had been on Sanford, like you you mentioned, but again, he didn't do much after this. Uh, Jack Sue obviously died uh, in the middle of this this show. Uh, the the one who was the most well known is as you said, I think earlier, because he was such a great and ubiquitous a character actor was James Gregory, but he was always that he was always a character actor. So he wasn't mm -hmm. and, oftentimes, and oftentimes he was wearing makeup on, on a sort of 1960 sci-fi show. He was the planet of the apes. You yeah. know? Right. Exactly. So it wasn't like he was a household name like Mary Tyler Moore or Alan Alda, you know, stuff like that. And the, and the other thing is, and this is going to, we're near the end so I can break out my dark, cynical uh, side. Um, it's really intelligent. It's really intelligent. Gilligan I Gilligan's Island is really dumb. I mean, no offense to anyone who likes it, because like I said, there's there's silly shows that I like too, but but it's Gilligan's Island is a dumb show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so this show was always very smart. Um, I actually what what I what surprised me the most when I went and watched the show over again when I was doing the book. This show, it, it is dated in some ways, like Mike mentioned the Ford to New York City drop dead episode, and they talk about the layoffs in New York City and, and the, all the financial troubles that were, were happening with the city at the time and all those things. In that way, it is dated. But as he also said, sadly, all of the issues they covered are still social issues today. Yeah. Um, there, and some of them might make some of the younger people uh, more uncomfortable. I mean, like my daughter, she, she comes at these shows as what she is, a 28-year-old woman, so that, you know, we grew up with all the family and the Jeffersons and Sanford and Son and, you know, all these shows where, I mean, I know for a fact in every one of those shows that I just mentioned, the N word was uttered in every one of those shows. Now, it doesn't matter the context. If you use that word in a show today, my daughter would, her mind would explode. Okay? 
So it, it, it's a different, it, I don't, I, I really, have not, I do think it's still underrated. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book. Because I do think for whatever reason, I think it's underrated. I think it should be better known than it is. Well, let me just it's funny that you mentioned, it, it's funny, it's funny that you mentioned about the N word because we, um, last month we had a, a session with the Institute of General Semantics with John McWhorter, who uh, wrote a book called Nine Nasty Words. And one of his arguments is that the N word has replaced the F word as the kind of the worst words that you can you can utter um but but i i did want to say um uh, it's that i too, that uh, the n-word was no, never one of the seven words that uh carlin had on his list. right right True. yeah um but but i did want to say i mean I, I do agree that there is no no one came out of it as a breakout star um you know again abe vigoda came into it in a way sort of like that but, um, you know, when you mentioned Night Court, I was thinking, the, the show that I was thinking of was Taxi. Mm. Um, and how, you know, you could compare the two and, and look at all the folks who came out of Taxi um, who were, you know, went on to become big stars. Um, you know, and the, and the contrast is, is very marked. Um, I think, you know, the, the thing I would say about Barney Miller is its subtlety. Um, the, you know, when you talk about its intelligence, it's a subtle intelligence that, um, and, and, it, and it's, it's not groundbreaking in that sense. You know, that is, again, going back, Mary Tyler Moore, Mesh, all in the family, they broke new ground. Barney Miller followed in their footsteps. It did some really great stuff, but it didn't really change the game for anybody. Um, you know, we can see it as leading to some of these other programs that, that push the boundaries even further. Um, but I think in, in some ways, it, you could arguably say it's a show that whose time has come, again, because of George Floyd and because of uh, all of the concern about uh, police work in, uh, nowadays. Um, maybe this is a show that someone needs to pick up on uh, you know beyond our our session here or your <clears throat> podcast mic or <clears throat> Otto's book, but someone needs to pick up on and kind of bring it to the fore. Um, and dare I say it, I, I, I shudder to say this, you know, even a reboot, um, you know, might be in in, in order in, at this moment in time. Yeah, but then they would they probably would have have like you know. Ruin uh, it. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. a trans woman as Barney, you know, or something. <laughs> and, and they, and not not that, that you can't have trans people as comedic characters, but it, it would probably be so over the other side of trying to please every group, where, whereas this one wasn't. Um, yeah. you, you did anticipate my question that I was going to end with uh, you, Lance, and I want to ask you all, all to just give a little summary of why you think it's great. But I did want to stand up, though, for Gilligan's Island for, for, for this reason. <laughs> uh, uh, because if I think of all the high concept shows, the only high concept sitcom from the 60s that I think is in a league with Gilligan's Island would be Get Smart, but it isn't as timeless. And I think Gilligan's Island, the reason it is, along with I Love Lucy and the Honeymoon is the most successful show, is it is timeless. You can be you could be 500 years ago, 500 years from now on a desert island or on some asteroid or something, and the, the same premise, Gilligan's always going to fuck up that they're always never going to kill him so that they can get off the island. And I think it's the closest thing to an American Beckett. But um, let, let, me, uh, let me just uh, go you know, I, Dan, I have to say, I never, I never thought of the fact that if they had just killed him, yeah. they could have gotten <laughs> off that island. Yeah. Well, well, you remember the, the, the episode where, where the island's sinking, but it's just Gilligan moving out, moving the, th the professor's stick out a little further or, or whatnot. But uh, so let's, <laughs> let, let me start with you, uh, Otto, then. Uh, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen Barney Miller, uh, why is it a great show and why should they watch it? Um, for, for all the things we've talked about, I mean, for me, the, the greatest aspect is the fact that it is about the human condition. It is about it is about laughing at ourselves. You know, Danny's main idea of the comedy for this show was 
Paranoids with Proof. And there are numerous episodes where someone comes in. My favorite one is the guy who has come in and they've arrested him because he was he was in the department store and he found the room where the Muzak was originating and he smashed the Muzak machine because it was driving him crazy. And they bring him in and they think he's just another crackpot, right? And when they put him in, he's like, no, no, no. He's like, I have proof. And he pulls an article out of his jacket, a newspaper article, and it tells you in the article that these stores are actually putting subliminal messages in the Muzak, which, by the way, on the DVD release now, you see that they, they bleeped out Muzak yeah. because it was a brand name. But um, that was a big thing. It happens in more than one episode. There's another one with Don Kelfa where he's, uh, he he's comes in because he says he rode the New York City subways all his life. And he pulls out an article where they show that the government had been testing germs in oh, the yeah. subway and that he felt he was sick because the government was doing this. So Danny, that was a real, like, linchpin to the, to the show was Paranoids with Proof. Again, something that makes it kind of really relevant today, except most of our conspiracy theorists today are, are really are crackpots. Yeah. But this is, you know, I, it's the thing that I love most about it is, is the humanity of all the characters and the fact that in the end, the point sort of is we're all in this together. We're all kind of stuck in this crazy world together. Lance, same question. Why is Bonnie Miller great and why should someone watch it? Well, I really like Otto's point, you know, about the human condition. Um, you know, I would say, you know, with that, that it just depicts fundamental decency, you know, that, and, and you know, that, that so much of, of the comedy that we have today kind of feature characters who are just kind of crappy people, um, like, you know, like Curve Your Enthusiasm. And, you know, that becomes part of the joke. And, you know, and part of the identification is to, you know, connect to that part of all of us that we sort of cringe at or are the experiences that, that we cringe at. But, you know, this is just that, you know, people can get along and people can be good to one another um, and be sensitive without being, you know, super woke about it, you know, to just, just be decent to one another. And that's the way the world should be. And, and things would be a lot better you know, in that way. I, you know, with that, I think, you know, is the point that it was really well written and, and intelligent. And you can do that without hitting you over the head with its sort of intellectuality. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, make you feel like this is real. This is, these are, you know, real people. These are people that you can really like and feel good about. Uh, and before I finish up with Mike, I will link to uh, uh, the academic page for, for uh, Lance. I will link uh, to uh, uh, the book uh, on Amazon for uh, uh, Otto and also your podcast page. Mike, Mike uh, same question if you're on Barney Miller. Why is it great and why should we watch it? You know, if anybody said that it's just, it's simply funny. It is really solidly funny. Every single episode, I find myself laughing. You mentioned the hash episode. I mean, you you could be dropped into that, not really knowing who these characters are. You can get a sketch of them, uh, such a thumbnail within the first five seconds of watching the show and find that episode as funny as anybody else. It is so good. And so much of that, too, is the chemistry between those characters. And they really did a great job of never losing that chemistry. Even though they changed up who was in that station house, having those constants of Barney and Wojo and Harris, I mean, those that core group and having all those other characters who are coming in and out, 
they managed to keep that magic, which is really remarkable that they were able to do that and not lose the thread when they're losing characters and gaining characters. I mean, you could say, oh, well, Nick was dry and, and Dietrich was dry, but they never canceled each other out. They were perfect. They were great balance. And then even when you lose Nick, you've still got Dietrich. I mean, everybody just brought their game to this and, and, and the writing, top notch. You know, that's where so much of the comedy came from. So just, yeah, solidly funny day in, day out, every single episode. Even when they have a poignant episode and a poignant moment, you still get a really good blast of comedy in there. And I, I, I just want to add, usually I don't, but I, I just want to add, the show is Barney Miller, and I have to say, Hal Linden is greatly underrated, not only as a stand-up uh, comedian, because he started out, I think, as a big band singer, and, and here he is, the anchor, basically, of this comedy with all these other characters that are so well-written, and he plays he plays off of them so well, and he, he's, you know, I, you can't imagine Barney Miller or Linden ever saying, well, I need to have that line or, or something. You know, it seems so natural. And in all the years since, 40 years now it's been, it's like the only thing I can remember Hal Linden being in was in uh, one of the penultimate episodes of a show called Nowhere Man, a great uh, show on Fox, or no, on C, was it Fox or CW back uh, uh, in the mid-90s, a paranoid prisoner-like show. But, I mean, uh, I, I just think Hal Linden is a very underrated actor. Well, you know, it just, ironically, you said you, you can't imagine him wanting, you know, a line. Oh, don't, don't, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. No, 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 no. no I'm not going to spoil it. It's just he told me, he told me that in this, the hash episode that we've talked about, um, he went to Danny and he said, Danny, everybody's got this great aria, this great scene that they can do with this except me. And Danny says, yeah, he says, we got to have someone to play them, you know, that they can play off of. If we have to have someone in the precinct who's sober or else they're not that funny if you're all like that. And Hal said to me, he says, you know, I sort of knew it. But at the same time, in that episode was when I first finally accepted that that's what my role was, was to be the straight man and to be the anchor. And he says, then I felt much better about it. Um, but I agree with you. He was, he was fabulous and he is he, like the show being underrated. He's very underrated within the show because he doesn't have all those huge laugh lines. Well, I want to thank all three of you. It was a great yeah. show. Oh, go ahead. Um, just, you know, that he was a great actor and, and of course the Broadway actor. But... Well, you say was, he, did he recently die? I thought he was no, still he's still on, on the show, but I, oh. but, uh, you know, he also was very poignant, you know, and, and the thing that really sticks out for me was when he was separated from his wife and, and you know, and that was a point where the, op what's the opposite of jumping the shark, you know, it's like, you know, for me, that kind of blew me away as a young person watching it, just that they got so serious and that he so strongly conveyed that, that sense of emotion with, without really, you know, any kind of theatrics, but it just came across that, that terrible sadness of his marriage falling apart. Um, and, and, you know, that, that to me just encapsulates what he was as an actor. Yeah, it was very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks again. It was a great show. And uh, I, I really thank you for it. Well, thank you, Dan. This was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, yeah. Dan. I appreciate it. So one, and, two, uh, three, out. <laughs>